and Managing Director of Transparent Rx. And the title of the webinar you should see there uh, on your on your desktop. Before I go any further, I just want to make sure, uh, Michael, uh, could you send me a chat message? Let me know that you that you can hear me okay. Uh, and so I want to dive right in here. Uh, and I want to give you a little, little bit of background uh, about myself uh, because I want you to trust the source of the information that I'm going to share with you uh, here today. And uh, let's check here. Okay, appreciate that, Michael. I just want you to be able to trust the source of the information that you're going to hear uh, today. I've been in this business for almost 20 years started in 2002 with Eli Lilly uh, one of the big 10 pharmaceutical companies uh, I carried a drug bag uh, for a couple years and then worked myself into the corporate offices where I led an access team and we were charged with negotiating with PBMs to get our, our branded uh, diabetes portfolio onto the PBM's f formulary. And and listen, I was clueless at that time, you know, what was going on outside uh, of our of our inner, inner circle where uh uh employer sponsored programs were were or or plan sponsors were concerned. And so I caught the entrepreneurial bug, started my own mail order pharmacy, uh ran that uh for almost five years, cashed out of that business in 2010, right when what? Specialty drugs were starting to take off. At that time, I could call a manufacturer and they were just basically giving specialty dr drugs uh, away to anyone who, who would take them. That's not, the, there was no such thing as limited distribution drugs in 2010, that, that only came later. And so got a little frustrated with the reimbursements uh, that were coming back from PBMs, they were, and this is where my passion comes from. This is where my passion comes from. When 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 you're an independent and you you have to negotiate with with a PBM to to get into the network, and they say, you know, we're going to reimburse you for brand drugs AWP minus twenty two, take it or leave it. What are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? Uh, and so decided at that point, listen, if you can't beat them, join them. And I decided to do that and to start uh, the first fiduciary, pure to the truest sense of the word, fiduciary model, uh, 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 P PBM. And, I, and I've heard no one con contest that. And so uh, it is in my best interest to share with you all that I know. Uh, and so uh, there's no question that is that is off the table. There's no concern that is off the table. As a fiduciary, uh, we win when our clients' heads are pulled out of the sand. Uh, that hasn't been the case uh, so far in, in, our, in my industry. That hasn't been the case. Many PBMs benefit when they keep their clients' heads in the sand. And so we're trying to change that. And this isn't about transparent art. I, I just want you guys to know where this all comes from. This is about you and just giving you some good information today. If you have questions for me, everyone is muted. If you want to, want to be unmuted, I will unmute you from my hand. You can have the floor. Or if you have a question, most people prefer to send that question via the chat. Uh, the chat option, that little bubble at the top of your control panel there, uh, and send the uh, question via chat. And then when we have a break in the action, I will get to that question. And so I have some goals here for you today. I'm going to try to do my best to keep this. I've already talked five minutes uh, about stuff you probably don't even want to hear, but I had to do it. I have some goals here today, uh, uh, three of them. I want you to know how PBMs make money. Without knowing that, you can't address the issue of overpayments. You can't address the issue of opacity. 
in in the relationships between PBMs and their clients. And so I want you to feel something other than indifference because I want you to take some action, right? And so that action is to solve the problem, but it's probably going to be a little bit different than, than what you've heard in the past, how we go about solving that problem. So price is a concern, especially around specialty drugs. You you think they're they're costly now? They're only going to get more costly as as cell and gene therapies uh, s start to hit the market in in larger numbers. So for us, the issue around price isn't necessarily negotiating bigger discounts and bigger minimum rebate guarantees. That comes after you eliminate asymmetric information or information failure. Asymmetric information is simply this. When one party has access to information, these two parties are sitting at the negotiating table. One has access to information and just as important, has the sophistication to interpret the information and processes in place to interpret that information. And the other party lacks sophistication, lacks that same level of information. That party with the information is going to use it to its advantage. PBMs, and no one talks about this. We're starting to talk about it more. Everything that's happening in the marketplace today is around data. It is around information. PBMs intentionally withhold that information so that their clients can't calculate, can't determine how much they're making. That's what this is all about. This is an example of information asymmetry in play. You will often hear when you're trying to access information to understand if what you're being billed is fair. And, and I'm going to give you more examples of that here in a bit. But you will often hear things like, oh, we can't share it. It's proprietary. But we can't we can't let you audit s certain things. It's, it's in it's in the contract. Catch you, you can't do this or we only allow certain companies to come in and audit your claims data. That is information asymmetry to the truest form. I'm not sure of any industry that does it better than mine, and I'm not bragging about it. This is an example of information success or symmetric information. They're synonymous. For, for 10 years now, and, and we're going to get into this here in a second, but for 10 years now, if a PBM is radically transparent, we've been doing this for 10 years. Other PBMs who have never done it are starting to do it now because they're being forced to. An example of information success is the sharing of rebates that are being paid, manufacturer revenue that is being paid by the manufacturer to the PBM at the claim level at the claim level. Now, when we share this information with our clients, and I'm going to, if I have time here, I'm going to share with you, we just submitted some rebates for, uh, we just, uh, for, for Q2 of 2021. So our clients are starting to get these reports as we speak. I may even share with you one of those port reports so you can see it. I might get myself in trouble if I do that. But here's the point. This information here is being withheld, redacted for privacy reasons. But, you know, RX number, NABP, all that. If you don't know what that stuff is, go out and look at it. National Social Security Boards of Farms. Go out on the web and you can get all that information. It's populated when our clients receive the data. But the point is, is that our clients now can see what the rebates are that, that are being paid 
at the claim level. This is important, but it's especially important around specialty because of their costs. And with this information, you can now start to determine net cost for each drug. That's the benefit of, so historically, you may or may not know this, but historically, many clients, even larger clients, larger groups, 10, 20, 50,000 uh, lives, get only a an, uh, uh, an explanation of payments or um, with a single line item, rebates, and a bucket of dollars. No detail at all associated with that that will help them determine net costs for each drug at the claim level. That's the point of this type of information. So this leads me to the status quo. Typically, historically, plan sponsors, especially, it doesn't matter the size, really. I, I've seen small, large. It's, it's happened to them all. They enter into an agreement with a pharmacy benefit manager that calls for artificially too low PBM administrative fees. You know, the, the fee that a company would pay, a plan sponsor would pay to get access to the claim software, claims adjudication, maybe account management, customers, 24 seven customer service, a member web portal, a mobile app. That's usually what encompasses the admin fee and some clinical services like formulary management would be included in that. And so historically what's been happening is some groups have entered into agreements with PBMs where there's no charge for that. They've waived the fee. And in exchange for waiving the fee, that PBM client, that purchaser of PBM services, unknowingly allows the PBM to generate its service fee, its management fee through hidden cash flows. They're hidden not because we don't know where they're coming from. They're hidden because we don't know what they amount to. And so uh, a, a, an, an artificially too low administrative fee today would be anything below $6 per pay claim. You could factor it out to a PEPM or PMPM as well. When you underwrite it, it's all going to be pretty close. It'll be statistically insignificant whether you're using per pay claim, PEPM or PMPM. Now, I don't want you to go out and say, well, you know, you're charging me, you know, you, you, you get an agreement with a PBM and, and they say, we're going to, we're not going to, we're going to pass through everything and we're going to charge you $4 and 50 cents per pay claim. We're not going to make any other money. I don't want you to go out and say, well, you know, Tyrone said, you know, six, six dollars is, is the threshold. And if you, you know, if, if you go below that, you're going to make up for it. You're going to augment it somewhere else. What I'm saying is, is that the further away you get, and so here's the thing about pharmacy benefits management. I've learned the hard way. Nothing is ever absolute. You can make bold statements, but all it takes is, is one scenario that will make your statement untrue. So when I make bold statements, I'm prefacing that by, by, with generally speaking. So generally speaking, anything below $6 per paid claim is artificially too low. The further away you get from that $6 per pay, we got to pay bills, right? The further away you get from that, the likelihood of the PBM augmenting what it is charging in the using hidden cash flows goes up. So if there is no fee for the admin, and so the administrative fee is transparent. You can fully audit the administrative fee. It's easy to calculate. Number of claims, how much did I pay for it? These are more difficult because of what? 
information asymmetry. Here's a second source of very similar information. I remember I was in the middle of it when small molecule brand drugs were driving PBM revenues. You got smart. You cut that leaky faucet. You shut that leaky faucet off. PBMs have been more sophisticated. Through a process, it's called ballooning. When you shut off one area, that cost is then shifted. And so remember mandatory mail order? That for a while drove PBM profits. You got smart. You got wise. You shut that off. Then specialty uh, drugs, the complex uh, uh, more complex drugs, the big molecules, right? They were driving, and in some cases still are driving PBM profits. But now you're shutting that off. PBMs are already ahead of you. <laughs> They're already ahead of you. They know every five to seven years they got they have to shift the cost, and sometimes they go back, hoping you forgot. The other methods of hidden cash flows. And so, so now it is MBDCs, medical benefit drug claims. It's the wild, wild west in terms of what clients of, of PBMs and, and, and carriers are being charged for those drugs because no one's monitoring and they are very difficult. to monitor and get the information that you need to determine what is fair and what isn't. And so here, listen, I'm not here to bash PBMs. It may sound like that's what I'm doing. I'm not. I believe we offer a very, very valuable service. Despite what folks say, PBM should go away. Please stop it. You think we're bad? Leave it up to the pharmacies. I believe we offer a very valuable service. My issue has always been the hidden cash flows that PBMs drive. L listen, if, if an auto repair dealer wants to overcharge for a tune-up, that's about the extent of my, my car knowledge, by the way. Tune ups and oil changes. Go figure. But spending most of my professional career in the state of Michigan, school in Michigan, right? But, but if an auto repairman or woman wants to overcharge for a tune up, that's one thing. Hey, that's one thing. It's not life and death. This is life and death. So let, let's talk about some of these hidden cash flow sources. But before I do that, I want you to understand the PBM business model. And, and this is why PBMs, part of the reason why they've been taking advantage of their clients for so long is I run into smart people, very smart people, who, brokers and PBM consultants who don't understand a PBM like mine never takes inventory of the drug. We never control the drug. So pharmacy benefit managers, we contract with pharmacy. I'm starting with the contractual relationship. We contract with pharmacies in order to have sites uh, from which our plan participants can get the medications that they need to get better. We have to have clients who provide their services to those clients are third party payers like large employers, unions, uh, coalition, coalitions in some cases, cities, mun municipalities. It's a pretty exhaustive list. 
we reimburse those same pharmacies for the prescriptions that they dispense and then we bill our clients for those dispensed prescriptions and then the games begin there's three problems here and i'm just focusing on the right side of this this workflow this process flow there's three problems with what i just shared with you the first one the inflow of cash in the form of rebates from the manufacturer through the pbm to the pbm's clients is too low i shared with you two slides that indicate that manufacturer revenue drives 50 percent of pbm profits 50 percent that means that a large chunk of the dollars that manufacturers are paying the pbms are being siphoned off before you even get it no wonder you don't even know what's being paid on a per claim basis for rebates i'm going to talk about that here in a bit the second problem the reimbursement back to the pbm for ingredient costs those drugs that the pharmacies dispense and let's not even get me started when the pbm owns the pharmacy don't even get me started on that yet that amount is too high we're going to talk about that here in a second but the third problem and and i want to make sure that i i i clear all the scribbling off the screen before i say this look who sits at the top of this entire system you do your clients do guess who knows the least about how it works you fund the entire darn thing aside from co-insurance and co-payments you fund the entire darn thing yet you know the least about how it works it goes back to what i said earlier information asymmetry demanding access to your data and then having the skill set to interpret the information that you have i talked about the second problem reimbursement to pbms being too high the drug price standard was formed the basis for discounted prices is awp i don't have a problem with awp as long as you understand the role it plays in pricing once you understand that the pricing benchmark really doesn't matter whether it's awp asp nadac generic drugs and we're going to focus on generic drugs because 90 percent of the drugs in this country that are dispensed are generic unless you're a commercial plan sponsor and then maybe it's you know i don't know 82 83 percent which is horrible it's expensive it's wasteful spending generic drugs have two prices the awp listen it's artificial Officially inflated no one pays it and that's okay that's okay the second type of price is the Mac price it's more closely related to the acquisition cost but it too is higher than the AWP this is something I post on my blog blog.transparentrx.com 99% uh, of the time every Thursday and it is some generic drugs and brand drugs and we include what the pharmacy pays 
we include the invoice cost. But let me show you how this works. Stick with me here. Even if you understand AWP and Mac, stick with me here. So let's consider two pricing benchmarks. So normally in a PBM contract, well, I shouldn't say normally, because normally I don't see it when I analyze these contracts. But what you want to have in a PBM contract is lesser of logic built into the contract, meaning if if I'm you know if I'm Pam's uh, local supermarket and I've got 500 employees and and I want my contract to be transparent, I want included in the contract that I'm going to be billed the lesser of AWP, Mac, UNC, or the cost share, the co-payment, right? So in that instance, your Pam isn't going to be building thing. It's going to be all the co-payment is going to cover the cost of the drug. That happens a lot with generics. So I want the I'm going to be built the lesser of those four pricing benchmarks that are going to determine what I'm going to pay or whether I'm going to pay at all. By the way, many PBM contracts. They intentionally avoid including at at a minimum those four. Okay. That's called zero balance logic. We don't have time for that today. But uh, so let, let's uh, take a look at a, a level thyroxin here. Hundred uh, uh, and uh, micrograms tablets thirty. Right. So let's look at this here. Let's go. AWP is the, the, the primary benchmark here, and it'll be some sort of discount attached to it. And then we've got MAC. Right? Then we've got MAC. And the AWP, let's call it 560 to keep it simple. It's 560 bucks. Let's say Pam's PBM consultant is able to negotiate a generic effective rate for this product of 85%, meaning no matter what, just for just for the, the, the claims generics period, not for this specific one, but 85% generic effective rate is the minimum uh, discount guarantee that for a year generic should achieve, by the way. Uh, from what I've seen, it's, it's fairly high, right? It is fairly high from what plans actually achieve. But let's say, you know, Pam's PBM consultant is, is sharp. Let's, let's say 85%. And so 85% off of uh, 560, let's call it, let's keep it simple again. Let's call it 475. $475 discount, Pam thinks great you are doing a great job but pam doesn't know is what the pharmacy paid so that leaves 85 dollar difference here between the awp you can even go to 90 percent same scenario between the awp discount and what the pharmacy actually paid for this product four dollars Let's say the PBM is generous, 100% markup. Let's include the dispensing fee. Why not? Let's say the PBM reimburses this pharmacy $10. That leaves a $75, you guessed it, spread. The only way to know if a spread is taking place is if you, you know what you're going to be billed, no question about it. The other piece you have to have is what was the pharmacy reimbursed? Don't take anyone's word for it. Get the information. And OK, let's say that this product is on the PBM's Mac list. By the way, Mac lists are controlled by PBMs, the number of products on it, uh, the prices, the whole nine. 
let's say that this product, because it's generic, uh, is on the PBM's Mac list. And let's say on the Mac list, the price is $15. Flat price, not based on disc, $15. The cost to the plan sponsor doesn't change. The PBM spread now is five bucks. That's how it happens. Remember I said, don't take anyone's word for it. We don't deal in spreads. We pass everything through. That's what the state of Ohio thought. Until they received the data for what their pharmacies were be, being reimbursed. If Greg were here today, he would tell you this isn't necessarily information we've never had before. The state of Ohio pivoted. Instead of focusing on discounts, AWP minus or ASP plus or WAC minus. Instead of focusing on discounts, we want to know what we're paying you. Game changer. When they uncovered almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads, they terminated the contracts. This is public information, by the way. Misleading contract languages. Again, I touched on Mac list. I said I was going to talk about rebates uh, 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 here in a second. But the point I want to make about, about the Mac list is a lot of folks believe there's only one Mac list. There can be multiple Mac lists. Uh, and you know, you know, I've you know, I've been told reliable source, some PBMs have over 50 different Mac lists over 50 different Mac lists and, and its clients Mac list could be completely, not complete, but different than the Mac list used to determine what pharmacy is going to be reimbursed. What do you think is going to happen? The Mac list used to determine what a PBM can bill its clients has historically been more aggressive than the one used to determine reimbursements. All right, rebates by many names. Uh, uh, contract language gives the plan sponsor the impression there's only one rebate. When I talk about rebates, I'm talking about manufacturer revenue. I am talking about the reason manufacturers pay monies to PBMs is to either directly or indirectly help them gain market share, help them get their prescriptions into the hands of patients who doctors deem uh, is the right drug for that patient. Many of those dollars have been renamed. You see just three names here, and that administrative fee here is different than the administrative fee that a PBM's client would pay to get access to uh, claims adjudication. It is, it is a different administrative fee. The point is, is that your clients are entitled to all of it. At a very minimum, they are entitled to understand what it amounts to at a very minimum. This is public information. I know the dates here are old, but it takes a few years for this type of information to leak out. But this is all public. You can do some search on, research on the Internet. It's out there. But essentially, Express Scripts sued this uh, specialty drug maker because the specialty drug maker refused to pay the rebate. They didn't believe they owed, or maybe they believed it and just didn't think Express Scripts would sue, but they did. And what was uncovered here, if, if you don't believe, here are the formulary rebates for one drug, FZO. 
Here are the administrative fees that Express Scripts said was owed to them. They dwarfed the formulary rebate. They dwarfed the formulary rebate. Here are more types of rebates. And, and listen, the name uh, market share rebates, admin, manufacturer administrative fees, formulary rebates, access rebates, price protection, or sometimes you may see it in a contract, uh, inflationary rebates, also product discounts. These are all rebate dollars that are paid based upon drugs being dispensed. In the diagram, I showed you um, and the U.S. Pharmacy Reimbursement Dis Distribution System uh, 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 diagram, I, sh I showed you formulary rebates in that line. The reason I said it was too low is because much of these can be excluded because of what? The contract. Outcomes rebates performance-based rebates. These, these deals have been happening for over 10 years. Where if a product doesn't work and they're drug specific, if a product doesn't work, then the PBM is being reimbursed either 100% in the form of a rebate of the original cost or, or a percentage of it. And then these are the metrics that are that are determining that. Here, some PBMs have been so brazen that in the contract it will say something like uh, clinical uh, uh, manufacturer clinical programs or or. Uh, uh, value based reimbursement programs, something along those lines that the client isn't entitled to any of that money. What? I talked about how when you get smart and sophisticated and you cut off a revenue source of a PBM, that last one was specialty drugs. Stay with me here. I got about five more minutes. The best part is coming up. I talked about how Specialty drugs uh, are now driving the biggest uh, share of profit for PBMs and how PBMs have already started to shift that. And I talked about medical benefit drug claims or MBDCs. A part of that, not just on the medical side, but the pharmacy side is now major PBMs have formed GPOs or group purchasing organizations. And so now, instead of keeping rebate dollars or manufacturer revenue, they call it GMF fees or, 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 or uh, stands for group purchasing organization, organization or GPO management fees. So GMF stands for GPO management fees. So now they've shifted the cost to these G, these GMF fees. So th these are these are all GPOs that are being formed and they're all racing partner with one another to protect those revenues. So here's the bottom line, and, and I'm getting to the best part here, is start looking at what you're paying the PBM. That's the bottom line, because the significance of that is, think about this for a second. As a PBM, we're hired to negotiate with man drug manufacturers. 
were hired to negotiate with pharmacies and, and chain pharmacies for what? Discounts. For discounts. Because they buy the drugs or make the drugs. <laughs> Not us. So we go to them and negotiate on your behalf. What we negotiate is finite. It's set in stone until those contracts come back up for renewal. So if you're unhappy, we can't go to Eli Lilly and say, hey, we've got this large client that's unhappy with the rebates. Can you can you give us a little bit more? That's not the way it works. The point I'm making is that whatever you don't negotiate and demand that we pass back to you. Is what we're putting in our bank account. And I say our because we are a PBM as well. We only put the admin fee in. You probably don't believe me. You probably don't, but there's not a single client who's gonna tell you otherwise. The point, the, the beauty, the genius of the business model, the revenue model, is that the PBM's take home, what it puts in its bank account is hidden here everyone talks about pbms at cost of the supply chain but they don't know how they don't know where it's in the final plan cost i'm going to show you a real life case study this is the best part coming up B before i do that it, the C cvs ceo said this in an earnings call said this in an earnings call this is public information as well. Pulled it right off the internet. He said, we underwrite contracts over our level of profitability and many levers available to the pool depending on the preferences of the client. In layman's terms, what he is saying is this. And mind you, the word contracts, could, we couldn't even get past the third word in the sentence. Yet, you or your clients select the PBM that you want to service serve you before the contract is signed. <laughs> you not only select, but you tell them you're going to be our PBM. Let's work out the contract. The contract has to be worked out modifications made before you select the PBM. It has to be memorialized, the changes memorial before you select the PBM. So the, the, here's my point. In layman's terms, we are going to make as much money as we possibly can. The amount of money that we are ultimately going to be able to make for you is going to deter depend on how sophisticated or unsophisticated our clients are. That's what that means. The more sophisticated clients, there are less levers to pull. The unsophisticated, all the levers are essentially available. Here's what we come up with internally to determine the PBM's take home, what it's being paid. Everything in green, and you could even, listen, I'm gonna scratch this out and I'm gonna put DIR fees here. Look it up. Everything in green at some point lands in the PBM's bank account. An example of a cash disbursement, money that leaves the PBM's bank account after all this money enters the PBM's bank account will be a reimbursement to a pharmacy. 
And so when I say the PBMs are more aggressive with plan sponsors, when I say they're more aggressive, it is meaning that they are going to charge a plan sponsor more than they pay out the pharmacy. That's how spreads come about. But, and so that also means on the opposite side that we are more aggressive in our pricing and what we're going to pay for. That's what generates the spread. So a spread is an example of a cash disbursement. Another example is a share of rebate dollars, manufacturer revenue passed back to you or your client that, that wasn't siphoned off by the PBM. That's a cash disbursement. Whatever is left over is what the PBM is paying itself. And that's what the state of Ohio determined we're paying you too much. You even see now PBMs having being sued and paying states now millions upon millions of dollars because they're now looking at what are you keeping? Because it ultimately goes into what? The plan's final cost. So the new path says this. Ideally, the PBM makes money one way. It's through the administrative fee. That way, it's it, you can audit it. You can audit it. It's easy. And then the PBM now is contractually forbidden with damages in play if it makes money any other way. That's the best case scenario. I would also add that if you are going to allow the PBM to make money through these cash flows here, you have to know what it amounts to. That's the other option. There is no third option. One of our clients that we brought on during the height of the pandemic, all in by the end of the year, we cut their PM PM all in cost by almost was $35 per member per month. I talked about the earnings after cash disbursements. One could fairly assume because Prime Therapeutics is way bigger than we are, that they get better, bigger rebates from manufacturers and they get uh, bigger discounts from pharmacies. So why are they charging almost three times as much as us. That earnings after cash disbursements for prime therapeutics, if their costs are equal to ours, we all know that their, their costs are better, but let's just say they're equal. They were pocketing $35 per member per month as their management fee. Folks, it is higher than the freaking drugs cost. I got a problem with that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up uh with with this and uh here's what I'm going to say uh in order to initiate change you got to be aware a problem exists you're here today because you're aware of that and your awareness might be heightened now the most important piece of this is the maintenance piece Right. You got to do take some action and then you can't give up on it. As soon as you do, the PBM moves the needle. They move the goalpost. It requires. Indeterminate amount of time. Be efficient in managing the pharmacy benefit. We've got the first designation 
that focuses on being a good steward of the pharmacy benefit, managing the pharmacy benefit that's backed by a major university. The current class is full, starts on Thursday. We've got another one in June. There's CE available for life and health, HRC, CI, and SHRM, as well as pharmacists. Listen, I talked about and I'm wrapping up here. I know nothing about automobiles. I shared that with you already. When I have to get my vehicle repaired, I go into the, the shop and I stick my chest out and I raise my voice because I know deep down I know nothing about cars, but I don't want to get taken advantage of. The only thing I can do is bang my hand on the table and deny services that I probably need and accept some that I th that I don't need because I lack sophistication when it comes to cars. I should be taking someone in there with me who's an expert or do business with someone who's 100% transparent and is not going to take advantage of me. It's tough to do, tough to find. Don't be me. Get the information, get the knowledge. Let's change together how PBMs do freaking business. Listen, that's my time today. Everyone be safe. I'll stick around just in case any questions come through. Uh, uh, but be, be, be safe out there. Thank you.